she went in on one baby aspirin. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I came to surprise her, day 27, I walked in on her and I walked, I walked past her three times because I didn't recognize her. Welcome to the Blind Mom Life Podcast. I'm your host, Chelsea Painter Davis, blind wife, mother, and public speaker. I want to invite you to dive deep with my special guests and I as we talk conquering disabilities, cherishing motherhood, and choosing life. Are you ready? Action. <laughs> Another week, another movie. So for today's episode, we are talking fried green tomatoes. I know. It's been forever since I've seen fried green tomatoes, but I couldn't think of a better story to share with this week's episode. So fried green tomatoes follows the story of a middle-aged woman named Evelyn who meets an unexpected friend at a nursing home, Minnie, who is much older than Evelyn, but is able to speak so much wisdom and truth and enthusiasm into Evelyn's life. It really empowers her to take control of her life once again and start living in a way that she can feel like she's really present. Wow. I like this story so much. I remember when I was a young kid and my mom would always make time for elderly people. And I didn't think much of it at the time, but I think it really spoke into my heart because now when I see people who are twice my age, more than twice my age, I don't feel the same kind of barrier that I might have when I was younger. I see someone that I can relate to, that I can ask how they're doing, that I can get along with as long as I figure out the right questions to ask them. And age doesn't have to be a barrier. There's so much they bring to the table in friendship. There's so much I can share in our friendship. And the age gap isn't that big of a deal. We're still there and we're still friends. And I feel like fried green tomatoes really sh highlights that part of the story, just like I saw in my mom's life when I was a kid. And I want to share another dear, dear friend of mine with you, Chrissy. She's someone who's been around in my life since I was a little girl. And the story she has about respect and relationships and friendship with the elderly is truly incredible. And I'm so excited for you to hear it. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast to share your story with us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh my goodness. Well, my name is Christine Canavan Hunt. <laughs> I just got married December 22nd. Uh, three beautiful children, a little granddaughter. And speaking of granddaughters, uh, I have a company that celebrates 20 years this year, and it's called A Granddaughter's Promise. So uh, I guess I have been an advocate for the elderly uh, for 20 years, helping to protect them from neglect and abuse and kind of be a liaison when families have to start thinking about finding resources for their loved ones, uh, making sure that they're not taken advantage of, stolen from, misled, or harmed. That's amazing. Congratulations yeah. on 20 years. Thank you. Yeah. So have you always had a heart for the elderly or is this something that kind of grew um, over time? Absolutely not. I didn't want anything to do with the elderly. <laughs> no, no, Chelsea's for real. Like uh, it was, it's so interesting how God is because when I was a senior in high school, uh, my best friend, Kathy brought me to visit her grandmother in a nursing home. And there was a little lady in blue polyester pants with bright white Nikes that chased me down the hallway. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Calling me the dog of a dog. And so since then, I, you know, I was like, it made me a little nervous. True story. Uh, but then the Lord definitely put a burden on my heart for the only minority we all become. And that's elderly. So what brought you to um, that change of, or that softening of your heart for the elderly? Well, my grandmother uh, lost her life in assisted living with it less than a month from horrific abuse. 
uh, really, I, I don't, I don't want to upset anybody on your podcast, but it was horrific and she died and, uh, they were charged with, what was it? Seven, 17 counts of, of abuse and neglect. And after she died, I just thought, okay, I've got to do something or else it'll be in vain. And that's, that's what it was, is I was going to make sure that this didn't happen to anybody else within my means. Wow. So that I could not have them experience what we had to go through. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with your grandmother and what led up to that event? Oh my gosh, Chelsea. Gosh, you're making me cry. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Well, you knew her, you know, which is amazing. I did. Yeah. Um, she lived with us for 10 years. Um, my parents traveled and mom and dad were just so um, helpful in having my grandmother come and, and stay with us. And so she lived with us for 10 years and then she started to um, have accidents, uh, incontinence, and mm -hmm. she was falling. And I was like, I had two small children at the time. And I thought, what am I going to do? I can't do this anymore. I'm scared. And so I called around and there was no one that could help me understand how to start to search for living options and resources. And so, um, my relationship with my grandmother was very, very close. And I felt a lot of guilt. I felt like a very bad granddaughter. And that was because I was, um, really exhausted. I was exhausted with, you know, uh, two small children, two and three, and uh, taking care of my grandmother. And when you're that exhausted, you can lash out at them or your family because you're completely overwhelmed being a mother, right. <laughs> being a wife, being a caregiver, uh, having some work on the side, contributing to your household, your church, mm -hmm. and your community. And at that point, That's you a lot become of really vulnerable too. Yeah. So... That culmination did not lead to good things. However, they led to an awareness that I'm now able to share. Um, we've helped over 5,000 families over the past 20 years oh, navigate. So yeah, many. Through, that's amazing. yeah. Yeah. So that's my relationship with my grandmother is ongoing still because every time we help someone, um, we thank Sally. So God used it after all. He took something that was really bad and allowed a lot of good to come from it. When you knew that you couldn't take care of your grandmother by yourself anymore in your home, right. what was it like, I guess at that time, just pulling Scary. out a phone book, trying totally. to find someone? Oh, it was awful. Chelsea, mm -hmm. I didn't know where to begin. Seriously, I'm like, why am I being handed this responsibility? And then I think because I'm a, I can be a strategic thinker sometimes. I'm like, okay, I don't know anything about it. Let me, surely the sheriff's department or the Alzheimer's foundation could help me. And they couldn't. They, they, really? Granddaughters, Granddaughters Promise was the first elder placement advisor and family support specialist in the state of Florida. Oh, wow. The I didn't realize one. that. And so it was a brand new industry to Florida. Um, having an advisor walk you through everything. Mm -hmm. So it was scary. Uh, it was frustrating. I felt guilty. Mm -hmm. And those, that culmination kept me from making a good choice when I went to go and look at living options because I looked through uh, aesthetic eyes rather than uh, generational eyes. Right? So that we makes can be, a lot of sense. We can be fooled by, oh, look at the baby grand piano. Oh, look how beautiful this place is, right? Mm -hmm. But your loved one really isn't going to feel safe in that big world. And, and they just really want to feel safe and familiar. Mm -hmm. So the problem is when you're left on your own to learn about these things, you yourself become vulnerable because you don't have the mindset for what's coming next for them or else you would be looking in a different way. You know, you would look at dementia, uh, small care homes, which are 
bed and breakfast style assisted living facilities with one-on-one -on -one care. Um, if your loved one was more uh, social, maybe a, a bigger place, you understand, with resources. But when you don't know where to begin, you can make some really big mistakes. And uh, so you just feel, and you, and you feel a sense of abandonment sometimes as well because it's left to you on your lap. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot. When you did find a place for your grandmother in those, that early time when you weren't really educated in the industry, what made you pick that place? Like what was the appeal of it to you that you thought it would be the best place for her? Yeah, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. You walked in it, it, aesthetically. It was lovely. Mm -hmm. So it looked like something that I would like to see her be involved in mm -hmm. and my perception of how she could enjoy those things rather than having the knowledge of she doesn't, she, this is way too much for her. Mm -hmm. So I really liked that. It looked like a docked cruise ship made me oh, feel, yeah. made me feel less guilty. Like she was going on vacation. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. And the yeah. people there were just, they were salespeople. So their job was to get people into the community and not knowing anything about it. They changed her medication. She went in on one baby aspirin. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I came to surprise her day 27, I walked in on her and I walked, I walked past her three times cause I didn't recognize her. Uh, what they did was they, well, they smashed her head up against the wall they had a bar of soap that they shoved into her mouth so deep that it had teeth imprints on it. She had bruises mm -hmm. everywhere. It, it was it was horrific. It was horrific, Chelsea. Um, so I was fooled by how beautiful it looked, and I didn't look past the perception that I would like to have for her. It it just was. It was like Universal Studios, you know, when you mm -hmm. see all these little small towns and everything, and it's just not real. Yeah. How did you respond when you recognized the signs of abuse on your grandmother? Uh, I wish you could see my face right now because I'm like, do you really want me to say anything? Because <laughs> it wasn't good. <laughs> you don't have to tell me where you buried the bodies. You can skip that okay, part. Like, <laughs> I'm like, you can see me, and I'm like, <laughs> uh, but anyways, I, I called 911. I called oh, 911. Wow. It was that bad. And there was blood everywhere. And oh. it was awful. Chelsea, it was disgusting. And so I called 911 and they took her to the hospital. Uh, and they said, yeah, she's been, she has trauma. Mm -hmm. Brain trauma, swelling. Oh my it goodness. It was terrible. Yeah. Contusions. So, and then what happened, you want to know what, what happened is, uh, when I first found her looking shabby, like she was and incoherent, mm -hmm. we looked yeah. at her medicines and, uh, there was like seven new medicines that I didn't, or my mother didn't authorize, which were psychotropic drugs. I call Are them. Are they allowed to do that? Uh, well, no, they were supposed to talk to a healthcare surrogate and they didn't. They did mm -hmm. what was easiest for them because she was paying a lot of money. Mm -hmm. She wasn't appropriate. So they drugged her up so that she would not disturb the community. Wow. And so someone got upset with her and then smashed her head up against the, it was just awful. Just oh Chelsea was goodness. awful. Um, so the bar of soap I took and uh, I called 911 and the administrator came up and I said, how do you explain this? And I showed her the soap and she said, um, she said, well, I'll need to take that so I can show my director. And I said, well, how about you pull it from my cold dead hands? Cause I'm not giving it to you. I gave it to the police. Yeah. And then that was that she went to the hospital. She went into a rehab and there's, she couldn't, she just didn't get better. And she, she passed away. Oh, wow. I'm but, so sorry that that happened to you, oh, Chrissy. It's really this is terrible. a very, this podcast is very personal. You know, I feel like I'm sitting at the table talking to you and I probably wouldn't do this if I was, if you were like a newscaster, I think I would be far more professional, but 
this is where we make the mistake of thinking that we have to be professional when we really just need to be, uh, yeah, we, we need to come together and talk about things that are not fun to talk about, you know, like how are we going to pay for this or things that you may be embarrassed about that your loved one may be doing or how they're behaving. Mm -hmm. And that ends up really bad for everybody involved. So we have to be able to ask questions and ask for help and know that there's somebody there that's going to actually take the reins for you Mm -hmm. because that stress could cause the caregiver to have a lot of problems as well. Mm -hmm. I'm really, I'm really happy that you're bringing attention to this with your platform um, with pro-life because I feel the same way that just because they're closer to dying doesn't mean that they're dead, you know? Mm -hmm. In fact, we're called to honor them even more so instead of sweeping them under the carpet. And that's what happens. I mean, they're literally called butts in bed by some uh, administrations, not mom or dad, not our patients, but butts in bed. Mm -hmm. Isn't that horrific? Yeah, it it really shows how they're looked at as just a number of income on an income sheet. And, And, you know, you get a lot of people that, become bitter because of that because they didn't start off that way mm-hmm. and it's turned into a business so they're not allowed to actually be compassionate because there's not enough time mm-hmm. it's 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 really it's something that we need to do better where we need yeah. to do better I know my uh, my husband is a physical therapist assistant and the times where he would get reprimanded when he was working in a nursing facility it wasn't that he wasn't giving good care it wasn't that he didn't know the body and the muscles and what the patient needed it was because he was wasting too much time making a little old lady coffee and she's not her insurance isn't paying for him to make her coffee so he wasn't supposed to be doing that wasting time and it was just a moment in him he's like i can't i can't be that person to just drop someone off and say see ya next time i'm billing it's just not who he is to treat people like that and so I definitely see how, like, when you are have your nose in this paperwork, you don't see mom and dad anymore. And they feel invisible. Mm-hmm. They feel invisible. But you know what? There's great alternatives. And I think just getting the word out there, mm-hmm. that is where our efforts need to be. Um, it's just the lack of understanding of how to find the best match mm-hmm. for your mom or dad. It comes down to that. And mm-hmm. people don't know that if they um, don't have enough money. If, if mom or dad served in the military, they, gave, they get close to $2,300 a month each month to help to pay for, for care and assisted living. Oh, no, wow. one's tell, no one's sharing that information. Um, there's, there's all kinds of wonderful resources, free resources out there to empower caregivers mm-hmm. that our families don't know about. So there are some wonderful wonderful resources, but we're just not getting the information out there. Like a placement advisor, for example, um, as a placement advisor, my job is to listen to the families first and help them process what they have to do. Cause there's a lot of guilt that comes along with that, especially if you're taking your dad's car keys away or yeah. you feel like they're taking their independence away. And a lot of times they don't take those car keys away and they end up not in a, in a good situation. Um, Mm -hmm. so I try to listen to families. Then we talk about their loved one, right? Because how in the world could you even, and that's what people have to look out for. If you're touring places and you, they don't even bother asking about what your mother or father did, their siblings, their hobbies, their interests, then, then that's a warning. That's a red flag right there. So getting to know the family dynamics, their budget. If they don't have a lot of money, then I, I want to plug them into some resources that they may be eligible for. So I do that. And, um, and of course, we get their assessment or their diagnosis. And then we take them on tours of assisted livings that, for Granddaughter's Promise, has the, the golden star. I only work with homes that I, I have confidence in because I've, I've placed people there. And so we'll take them on tours of assisted living, help them to move in monitor the first week or two, how things are going and then visit. And it's all free to families. I I get paid through the assisted livings, not, not by family members, but, um, that's amazing for families to be able to call you for free and get help. 
Yes. Yes, I want them to call me. I want I want to I don't think you're going to ever make a good decision if you don't know what your options are. And what area? Go ahead. They're bullied. This is important too for people. This is huge. If someone's in the hospital, like your mom or dad's in the hospital, mm-hmm. and if you are told that there's a, that your dad needs to go home day after tomorrow, they're going to he's he's discharged. He's got to go. Well, you believe and you're panicked. Well, we can't take him home. What do I do? You know, mm-hmm. it's against the law to do that. Your loved one can stay in the hospital for as long as it takes you to find safe discharge plans and resources. Oh, wow. So don't let anybody tell you you have to leave. Patients have more rights than they realize. Mm-hmm. So I try to help people from being bullied as well when they're at the hospital or can't speak for themselves. Kind of like what you do. (laughs) What areas in Florida do you service with a granddaughter's promise? Focus on Brevard County, uh, but have done placement all over the state of Florida, um, Mm -hmm. North Carolina, South Carolina, Colorado, upstate New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get to go visit those homes. Like I, I have researched here, but I've, I've, done my due diligence or do my due diligence if someone needs to be placed in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, what is the most um, meaningful placement that you've been able to be a part of? You mentioned 5,000 families in the past 20 years, helping them make sure that they're taking quality, uh, <laughs> handing off quality care of their loved ones. What's a story that you have that you've just been like, wow, I'm so happy I was there to, to stop like that, that all of them. It's like, all really? of them. <laughs> I can't pick one because once everything is done and they're all moved in, like literally within, it could be within two days. I can have someone discharged room set up at the, you know, tours done room set mm-hmm. up moving. I can do that. It's crazy, but I can do that because I know I've got to get the discharge pre in the 1823 and I've got, I can pull it all together very quickly. Mm-hmm. And so to see family members, around their mom or dad, because I place a lot of couples, when mm-hmm. I see their children just gather around their parents and they're just happy and their loved ones happy and not frightened, when they mm-hmm. turn back and look at me and they, they just, they just shake their hand. They're like, thank you. That, that, that means the most to me because mm-hmm. it's something that they couldn't have done for themselves. Yeah. So those are meaningful. And there's countless other ones. We've gotten vets out of the woods and placed where the communities come together and help to buy furniture. There's just so many wonderful, wonderful um, stories. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So um, like you mentioned, when you were younger, you were kind of intimidated by the elderly or just didn't feel super yeah, comfortable. I didn't understand them. dementia. I didn't mm-hmm. understand the behaviors from dementia. It was scary. It mm-hmm. was scary. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, so often like a lot of people respond to that and they just say, okay, well then I'm not going to visit a nursing home or I'm not going to deal with my family member when they get like that. What do you think that we as a society are, are missing out on when we just decide to disengage with this whole people group? Yes. Um, in fact, what we're missing very large component that we're, that we're missing is becoming intergenerational. And we're trying to work with the schools for bright futures where a student would be able to go to a licensed assisted living facility and they would have to learn something from one another. So it may be technology or social media for the student to teach. And it could be a little life lesson on, um, World War II or the Battle of the Bulge or uh, the Great Depression or standing on a gas line for four hours, you know, uh, it Mm -hmm. could be whatever, but there has to be an intergenerational exchange. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I would say you're going to be better. And I would encourage people to go in feeling honored to learn something and then humbled to share something. And that changes your mindset. Mm -hmm. How does it make you feel when so there's so many voices arguing that 
euthanasia or assisted suicide is like an appropriate response to elderly and aging. I remember one time I was talking with a woman and she was just going on and on about how when she gets old, she's going to just go somewhere and, and choose assisted suicide because she knows that there will be abuse in her future and it's not worth dealing with. Like, does that bother you when people talk like that about the elderly? Like their lives are already over, even though they're not on the ground yet. I have a hard time listening to someone who's not in the position of an elderly person Mm -hmm. speak about that. Uh, As for my thoughts on someone giving up and wanting to die, I think God calls you home. And I think that life is precious. And I don't care if it's at two days or a hundred days. I mean, a hundred years. Life is precious. So I think that that would be a very easy way to thin the herd here in America. That turns my stomach, but I'm going to be honest with you about that. Um, I think it's a lack of empathy or desire to step up and create new ideas and ways that uh, they could they could live happily and and enrich their communities. I mean, that's the bottom line is we don't have it. In other countries, they do. In other countries, they have got a uh, they've got apartments where they actually room with a college student and an elderly person. Oh wow! And their life uh, life expectancy is four to seven years longer than here in the United States because of that intergenerational. You know, if people have something to live for, they do, you know? And yeah. that could be as easy as reading a book to somebody. And this is why it comes back full circle for me where we have to just um, become more intergenerational. Because the less we do, the less used to it, it's not an issue. And then if they disappear, they just disappear. And that's horrible. Yeah. So we're losing a great source of wisdom and history for that matter. Can you tell us a little bit more about your grandmother? Um, I just don't want to, I don't want her only memory to be Aww, the bad things that happened to you're her. You're so sweet. Can, can you course. share about the good things that happened with your grandmother aside from the fact that um, she also inspired this beautiful promise of yours to care for other elderly people? Can you tell us more about her life? Sally, she was here on yes, Earth? she was Italian. Um, she and my grandfather had my mom, um, they lived in New York, Staten Island. My grandmother traveled all over the world, all over the world. She was independent and sassy. Uh, she was sassy when she was very sassy. (laughs) She was so good to my brother and myself, full of energy and got baptized six Mm -hmm. months before she died. Oh, wow. At 85. Oh, my goodness. We were at Ogali Christian Church, and there was a baptism. And my grandmother says, what are they doing up there? And I said, well, Grandma, oh, I think it was my mom who says, oh, they're getting baptized. And and my grandmother said, well, I think I'd like to do that. And um, my mom said, well, we'll call the church on Monday. And I'm like, let's go right now. Remember that, Mom? <laughs> and so she did. She went. She walked right up and got bap- dunked. And she came up and she goes, I feel so clean. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, so wow. Funny. <laughs> she was a hoot. She was hilarious. Do you remember <laughs> when she ate the birthday candles for her birthday cake? I don't remember that. I was very young when I met her. But I do uh, I do remember her living with you guys and being Katie's a part of your family. Katie's face was like, <laughs> she just ate the candles. <laughs> and here's your mom. Just spit them into my hand. Just, just spit that's them out. So funny. I mean, she's yeah, amazing. that sounds like my mother. <laughs> the best. My, one of my best friends. Yeah. Yeah. I thank you for that. You know, because I, I, I have to be reminded that she, as we all do, have a purpose. And God uses yeah. us in any way that he wants to. Mm-hmm. So I feel that God used her in a very, very mighty way. Uh, I mean, after getting baptized, which we never thought would happen in a million years. 
she's uh, she's helped countless people wow. by inspiring me to uh, just go, which is what I did. I'm just I didn't look back. I just knew I had to do something. Um, and I'm starting to get good at it, Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> do you? Um... You said that you feel like your relationship with your grandmother is ongoing after her passing. Do you feel like she would be proud of you for all the people that you've helped? You know, I asked her that question. And uh, she answered it. There's a writer. Her name is Kat. I got this call I went to. This is incredible. I went to go uh, antique shopping in Lake Geneva or, or, or uh, Eustis, Eustis area, I think. And uh, we went into one antique store. That's it. And I guess there's a whole bunch of it. And uh, I went back the next day. And when I was home, I got a phone call from this lady named Kat. And she says, I know this is going to be really strange and uncomfortable, but um, am I talking to, the, to Sally Wera's granddaughter? And I'm like, who is this? And I mm-hmm. thought maybe she said, well, um, my name is Kat. I'm an author, but I go to antique stores. And I and so I thought, I'm like, did I leave a business card? Because when I walked into that antique store the first time, I saw a picture up on the wall that uh, my grandmother had. It was very, very special. And very sadly, that picture that I had was destroyed by water. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that, I thought it was a sign from her. So I bought it. And it's hanging right in my bathroom. But what happened is that next day when I got that phone call, she said, well, I am a writer and I go to antique stores. And I was at an antique store in the same area that I was in. And she said she was going through these bins of like 50 cent photos. They're just photos. And she said, Mm -hmm. I noticed that there was a sleeve. And I pulled it up and she said, and there are newspaper clippings in there. And she said they were pristine, just beautiful. So she pulled it out, and it was my grandmother's wedding announcement. It was Whoa. her picture. Oh, no, it gets even creepier. It was her picture. It was a picture for bridesmaids. It talked about their uh, what they wore, because they used to describe the material, the orange blossoms in their hair. <laughs> so I'm flipping out, because my grandmother was from Staten Island. She never... Mm-hmm. What would, how did it, how did it get there in the same oh place? Goodness. Like the next day after I already found her picture that they found. So she drove over from Tampa and she brought me this box and she wrapped it in taffeta that the bridesmaids dresses were made out and she had everything for me and she gave it to me uh, as a gift. And so I see my wow. grandmother in ways that there's, there's absolutely no there's just like no possibility of it being anything else. I mean, give me a break to be in the same exact area where those antique stores one day from each other, where I found a painting of hers that she originally had. And then a stranger comes in and finds her wedding pictures wow. and announcements and then calls me. Cause she looked up the name and the name went to granddaughter's promise. And then she called me. That is amazing. Crazy, right? That's incredible. What advice would you have for a granddaughter, a daughter, um, or even a sons who are having to figure out how they're going to navigate care for their loved one and they just don't know what to do? Has much changed in the past 20 years? Um, What would be their first step now? Well, I would say try to have a conversation with your loved ones before you really need to take action. I would say go and look at what's in your community. I mean, we talk about burials, we talk about financial investments, but we really don't talk about what do you want? Where would you want to live? You know, what are your thoughts? So I'd say have those conversations. Go and look at some different living options in your area or call us and and we'll help you. Um, But also I would say um, go out and see what's in your community ahead of time you know, to prepare yourself for that. And, and, did, and I think it's really important to understand that um, they're not always going to be here. Mm-hmm. So I would say just 
I don't know, Chelsea, it's when you lose someone, it's a different story. You know, I can tell you now how I feel and it's a lot different than when before my father died. So I wish we would had more conversations about this. What piece of hope can you give to those families and maybe oh. that they've made mistakes, maybe they've made mistakes in the placement of their family members and they want to get into a better situation? Oh my goodness. Um, yes. Be empowered. Hard. I would want to say be empowered. Um, do not, I mean, of course, if it's an abuse situation, you need to call 911, but I would say you're learning the same time as they're learning. So forgive yourself because it's not a natural behavior to all of a sudden understand how to find resources and living options for your loved one. I mean, where would you have ever experienced that, right? Or learned about that. So be gentle with yourself for sure. Our seniors matter. Their lives are just as valuable as ours, whether a life is seconds old or seconds away from being gone. It has purpose and those people were meant to be here and their lives are meant to be cherished and respected. And it is such a big opportunity waiting for us when we use eyes to really see the elderly and notice them and engage with them and be there for them. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them what they need. Ask them what they want to tell you. Everyone has a story inside of them. You just have to find the right questions to ask. Time for Ask Me Anything. So the first question I have for you today is how do you keep your house so clean if you're blind? Yeah, I know. It's hilarious. My house is not clean. It is not clean at all. My house is filthy. It's a mess most of the time. But there are those occasional lovely sweet ladies who come over and ask me this preposterous question. <laughs> so I will share the number one tip that I have that makes my house somewhat bearable for me. <laughs> less is more. When you are blind, less is more more. The more toys you have in your house, the more spices you have in their cabinet, the more cleaners you have on the shelf, the more for you not only to manage, but to memorize as a blind person. It is very hard for me when I open my pantry and there's like 10 different boxes of like rice or or is it mac and cheese or is it like au gratin potatoes? I don't even know. And then I have to memorize those instructions because I didn't write it down on my voice recorder like I should have because why would I do that? I'm too busy changing diapers and I can't remember exactly how to make red lobster biscuits. Oh, I'm going to have to Google that again. Oh, I don't have time right now. And the less that I have in there, the less I have to think about, the less I have to figure out, wait, is this box heavy enough to be cornbread or is it so light that it's pancake mix? Wait, which one's heavier? I don't know. See, it's ridiculous. It's so hard. And the less you have, the easier it is to put all the toys away, to put all the spices back in the cabinet without them falling back on your head. And this is critical, critical when you are a blind person, because like I said, you have to memorize all of your items. You can't just glance over them and be like, oh yeah, I read that really quick. I know what I'm doing. No. No, if you don't already know what it says, you have to employ help to figure out what it says. And that can be a text to speech software on your phone, which takes time to pull out and takes time to load and half the time it doesn't work. Or you have to FaceTime somebody and ask them and half the time they're busy or you can't see on the camera. Or like my dad, you don't understand <laughs> and you need to get your glasses. And then, oh no, the box is backwards, the box is sideways. And it is a big mess. And I've just noticed that I feel so much more at peace in my home. I feel so much more in control with the less stuff that I have. And then on those beautiful, wonderful days, it gives the illusion to my guests that my house is oh so clean. <laughs> okay, so the next question I have for you is how do you clean up vomit and poop and pee when you can't see it? Well, let me tell you, it is absolutely disgusting. But what I have to do when someone decides to paint with poop in their crib when nap time was over, we'll name any names, take the child 
immediately out of the crib and I go set them in the bathtub. And that is a great place to zone in the chaos. I get the kids wiped down, rinsed off, bubbled up, all clean. And then I go put them in the living room and their jumper in a prison to play while I then disinfect all the poop out of the tub, cleaning the entire tub because, like you said, I don't know where the poop is. So I have to clean the whole thing. I mean, I can kind of feel them with my hands where the poop is, but that's pretty disgusting, and that's not all the bacteria and all the brown little shrieky spots. <sighs> so gross. And then after I get the tub cleaned, and the toys that I probably forgot to pull out of the tub first before I put the poopy baby in the tub, then I can move on to the crib. And once again, don't know where the poop is. So all of the linens go in the washing machine to get cleaned. And a disinfectant, Clorox, Lysol wipe, spray, paper towels, whatever I have in the moment, I clean the entire crib. All the railings, the mattress, everything. It is so frustrating and it's so annoying. And this happened so many times, so many times. But when my husband's at work and I have got to get it done, that's all I can do. So I want to make sure I cleaned it all up. So I just 100% clean the entire zone that I have decided in my mind, like this is where the poop got to. Let's clean the whole thing until we're done. If you want to see more content from me, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, X, YouTube, or you can check out my website, ChelseaPainterDavis.com. That is a great place to sign up for my newsletter or to check on my upcoming events. Do you want to see me in person? The next place I will be sharing my testimony is all Things New, a fundraiser for the Life Choice Pregnancy Center in Winter Haven on Friday, April 12th. I would love to see you there. Thank you so much for hanging around through the end of the episode. I hope today that we have shown you that all life is worth living. Just like in the book of Esther, where God paints a beautiful portrait from the background, God is painting a beautiful portrait with your life, and we can learn so much from each other if we only share our stories. Whenever it feels like the darkness is pressing in, just remember the words of Jesus Christ in John chapter 9. As long as I am in the world, I am the light. I need one more question for a blind person. What should it be?